Let me again this morning take this opportunity to welcome everyone who's with us, especially our visitors. We're blessed this morning with many. We're grateful for your presence. You always are our welcome guest. We want to encourage everyone to come back tonight at 5 o'clock. This being our fifth Sunday night, we're going to be having a devotional period in which men in the congregation are preaching and teaching. And this is always encouraging. It's always inspiring. It will be profitable. So let's all plan to be back tonight at 5 o'clock. We're here this morning because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. You remember in Psalm 66 and verse 16, David says, Come and hear all who fear the Lord. And I will tell what he has done for my soul. Well, when you look at David's statement, we could ask the question, what hasn't he done for our soul? He's done everything. We're here this morning because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We're here this morning because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Did you listen to Kenny as he read the scripture from 1 Corinthians 15? In verses 3 and 4, Paul explains to his brethren in Corinth that he had delivered to them what was first delivered to him. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. As we think about our Lord and His death, burial, and resurrection, make sure that we understand across this nation this morning, people are listening to, people are hearing about the resurrection of Christ. That interest is wonderful in and of itself. But as always, a word of caution is in order. When we talk about Christ, his death, His burial, His resurrection, let's make sure that we are focusing our attention upon His truth and not man's tradition. Let's make sure that what's being said is based upon His holiness and not our holiday. Isn't it interesting that when we talk about Jesus and specifically His resurrection, some do not believe in the resurrection of Christ. In Acts 23 and verse 8, they're like the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in any resurrection in an angel or in a spirit. And some today are just like that. They do not believe in the resurrection of Christ. When some hear the message of the resurrection, they mock God's message. Go back and look at Acts 17 and verse 32. That's exactly what they did in Athens when Paul preached to them. But still, others, when they hear what the gospel has to say concerning Jesus, His death, His burial, His resurrection, they unite it with faith. They believe in the Christ. They obey His blessed gospel. They become Christians. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, we know what Paul taught when he went to Corinth. He taught that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that it was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what he taught in Corinth. That's important because in Acts 18 and verse 8, it says many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were being baptized. They heard that same message that people spurn. They heard that same message that others mock at. And they believed it. They united it with faith. Well, this morning, we're talking about Jesus and His resurrection. And we're simply emphasizing three truths. Notice what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at the importance of Christ's resurrection Likewise, the significance of Christ's resurrection and the demands of Christ's resurrection. 
I'll also put this in the back of your mind that you can do some study regarding this. Next Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the marks of a resurrected life. This morning, our focus is upon Jesus. Next Sunday morning, we're going to be focusing upon ourselves. Do we bear the marks, the biblical marks, of a resurrected life? You see, when we're baptized into Christ, a death takes place. The old man dies, doesn't he? We're buried with Christ in baptism, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. And so the marks of a resurrected life, be looking at Colossians, the third chapter, in connection with that study. But the importance of Christ's resurrection, the significance of Christ's resurrection, and the demands of Christ's resurrection. Read with me this first point. The importance of Christ's resurrection. We're just going to read through these points. The resurrection of Christ has been called the crowning miracle of the Bible. And rightfully so. Notice also, no other single event in history has so much depending upon it. Well, notice this. Without the resurrection of Christ, every other Bible doctrine is without proper foundation. Notice still, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity is built upon the foundation of a lie. Notice in verse or number 5, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then all of his claims are buried somewhere with him. Do we realize what we're saying this morning? If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, Christianity is built upon the foundation of a lie. And all of the claims that Jesus ever made, they're buried with him. If, in fact, he was not raised from the dead. Thus, the resurrection of Christ is either the Christian's Gibraltar or his Waterloo. That's fact. That's reality. The importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be overstated. But notice the significance of Christ's resurrection. Now, think with me on this first point. The resurrection of Christ is the very foundation for and of our faith. Take your Bibles, please. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. You remember, this is where Kenny read from this morning. Paul introduces what was first delivered to him, which also he first gave to the Corinthians. Again, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter. But notice in the midst of this, notice again the resurrection of Christ is the very foundation for and of our faith. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and specifically verse 14. Notice what Paul says. Now keep in mind it seems that in Corinth Sadducean teachers had come. Remember what we said earlier, they didn't believe in a resurrection. So they're trying to discount the resurrection of Christ. And so Paul is telling the Christians about our Lord's resurrection. He's proving the Lord's resurrection. Look at verse 14. It says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Remember what we said about the importance of the resurrection? It is so important, it's so significant that if Christ was not raised from the dead, what I'm doing this morning, Paul says, is vanity, if in fact Christ was not raised. And if you believe it, that faith is empty if in fact Christ was not raised from the dead. Look what he also goes on to say in verse 17. He says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. If Christ was not raised from the dead, remember, He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. If He wasn't raised, 
we're still in our sins. And so significant, the resurrection of Christ is the very foundation for and of our faith. Look at number two. The resurrection powerfully demonstrated the deity of Christ. You remember in Romans 1 and verse 4, Paul begins that epistle to his brethren in Rome by saying that he was declared Jesus. He was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection. That's the message of the resurrection. This one that God raised from the dead is his very Son, his only begotten Son. Go through sometime the book of Acts and look at the preaching of the apostles and our brethren in the first century. That's what they preached. Our Lord's death, His burial, His resurrection. It's the foundation of our faith. And it declares Jesus to be what He claims to be, the very Son of God. Number three, the resurrection represents the completion of of our redemption. Romans 4 in verse 25 is interesting. Paul states in that context that he was delivered up for our offenses. Why was Jesus delivered up for our offenses, for our sins? Remember where we began, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was delivered up for our offenses. It goes on to say, He was raised for our justification. He died because of my sins. He died because of your sins. But He was raised for our justification. Notice, take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Peter 3. We should know the significance of baptism in the Bible. The Bible teaches that baptism is, without a doubt, part of God's plan for man's salvation. The Bible speaks of many things that save. And again, whatever the Bible teaches saves us, we better pay attention to that. Baptism is one of those things that the Bible teaches saves. It is not some optional suggestion that if you want to be baptized, the Bible teaches that we must be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. But notice how Peter says this. In 1 Peter 3, look at verse 21. Now remember what he's talking about, those that were saved in the ark with Noah, the eight. But notice what he says in verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. I'm reading from the New King James Version. There is now an antitype which saves us. Notice what he goes on to say. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, now notice this, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was delivered up for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 clearly teaches that baptism has a part in God's plan for man's salvation. And it also teaches that no one can have a clear conscience before God refusing to be baptized. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of a clear conscience before God and that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, look at number four. The resurrection provides the child of God with a living hope. I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. And as you're turning there, remember what was spoken in Ephesians 2 and verse 12. Paul talked about them in former days, they were without hope. They were without Christ. They were without God in this world. They had no hope. But you see, the resurrection 
It provides the child of God with a living hope. The one that we believe in, he's not somewhere dead and buried. He's not confined to a grave. Remember Acts 2 and verse 24, the grave could not contain him. Hebrews 7 and verse 16, he had the power of an indestructible life. The one that we live for, the one that we love, the one that we obey. He provides us with a hope, but it's a living hope. Look at 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. And it's through the resurrection of Christ. Again, this one that we put our faith in, this one that we trust, he's not dead, he's not buried, he's been raised. In fact, the verse that we put here on the slide, Revelation 1 and verse 18, do you remember what happened in that context? The saints in the first century, the time that John writes to his brethren in those seven congregations of Asia, that time was a time of persecution. It was a time of tribulation. But what he sees is a vision of one like the Son of Man standing in the midst of the candlesticks, Revelation 1, verses 12 and 13. A description is given of this one. It's Jesus Christ our Lord. And remember what he says at the end of all of that. I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. This one that was dead, they put him to death. But he was raised from the dead. A living hope is what every child of God possesses today because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, notice number five. The resurrection of Christ assures the Christian of his own future resurrection. Do we realize this? This life is not the end. Some mistakenly believe that when we die, the body goes to the grave and that's it. It stays there. No, what we're saying is the resurrection of Christ assures each and every one of us of our own future resurrection. The body has gone into the grave, but it will be raised. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6. Look at a verse here. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and specifically verse 14. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. It says, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. You see that just as Jesus was raised from the dead... That guarantees our resurrection. In fact, the verse that we put down here, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, that great resurrection chapter concerning Jesus, it goes on in that context to prove the resurrection. He is the first fruits of those who are asleep. First fruits intimate that there are more coming. Jesus in His resurrection is the first fruit, but we, by implication, are going to follow that. We will be raised from the dead. Notice, the resurrection of Christ testifies of ultimate victory for those who remain faithful unto death. That's what it does. Turn with me to John 5. John 5, look, if you will, at verses 28 and 29. John the fifth chapter, 28 and 29. We just talked about Jesus being the first fruits and his resurrection assuring the child of God their bodily resurrection. Now the body's not going to be the same. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 shows that it's going to be changed somehow in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. God in His power, in His wisdom, in His majesty, in His might is going to fit that newly raised body for heaven, for eternity. But look what we find here. 
In John 5, verses 28 and 29, notice what Jesus says. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Notice all are going to be raised, but some to the resurrection of life, others to the resurrection of condemnation. You remember what Paul says in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 7 and 8? He says, I fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall award to me on that day, but not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. That's what we're here for, to glorify him while we live to live for Him with that blessed living hope that as He was raised from the dead, so also we shall be. Now, consider this last point, the demands of the resurrection. We can't just walk away from the Bible story. We can't just walk away from Jesus and say, well, that was nice. He came to this earth. He lived for me. He died for me, for my sins. He was buried and He was raised again. There are demands behind the resurrection of Christ. Demands that we need to understand. Demands that we need to heed, to hearken, to obey. Notice this first one. Our Lord's resurrection demands that we confess Him to be the Son of God. You remember what we said in Romans 1 and verse 4. He was declared to be God's Son with power through the resurrection. That resurrection demands that I acknowledge that fact, that reality. That this one who died for my sins, he's deity. He's the very Son of God. He loved me so much to lay down his life. You remember in John 20, verses 27 and 28? Thomas, remember, he wasn't about to believe, not unless he saw for himself. Well, Jesus says, we can remedy that. You can see where the spear pierced me. Put your hand there, touch it. Look at the imprints on my hand. And remember what he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And that's when Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. That's what the resurrection demands. Jesus had been raised in John 20. Thomas saw his resurrected Lord, my Lord and my God. In Acts the 8th chapter and verse 37, when the eunuch had been taught about Christ, and when he has already said, look, here's water, what hinders me? Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And remember what he confesses, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what the resurrection demands from all humanity. And keep this in mind, in Philippians, the second chapter, we will all bow our knee. We will all testify one day. It may be too late. If we don't do it in obedience in this life, we will in eternity before God, His judgment seat. But again, our Lord's resurrection demands that we confess Him to be the Son of God. Christ's resurrection demands that we become obedient to His will. In Hebrews 5 and verse 9, being made perfect, He became to all those who obey Him the source of eternal salvation. Notice that. Unto whom is He the source of eternal salvation? The Bible tells us to all those who obey Him. That's what the resurrection of Christ demands. That I obey the risen Savior. That I obey the risen Lord. You remember Luke 6 and verse 46? Jesus asked a question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Great question still today. We can't say, I believe the message of the resurrection and I believe all of the things that you've said and be obedient to Him. 
That's not belief. That's unbelief. Why do you say, Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? In Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It demands our obedience. Jesus' resurrection demands that we no longer live for ourselves. Think about this carefully, closely. Because becoming a child of God, becoming a Christian, it's an awesome decision. It involves a majestic responsibility. I no longer live for myself. What did Jesus say in Luke 9 and verse 23? If any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what it demands. Paul even expounds upon that, if you will. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, the love of Christ controls me having concluded this. One died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all that those who live, notice this, should no longer live for themselves, but should live for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's a demand of the resurrection. That we no longer live for ourselves, we're living for Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And last of all, his resurrection demands that daily we work willingly and labor lovingly in His kingdom. You remember when we said 1 Corinthians 15 is that great resurrection chapter? After Paul convincingly proves the resurrection of Christ, he's talked about eyewitnesses in that context. But here's his conclusion in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's the conclusion. Let's work willingly. Let's labor lovingly. Why? Because we're serving a risen Savior. We have His promises, His blessings as we go through this life. In the resurrection of Christ, death met its master. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54. In the resurrection of Christ, sin met its answer, its solution. Remember, we were delivered up for our offenses but he was raised for our justification. So in the resurrection, yes, death met its master. Sin met its answer. Satan met his conqueror. And man has met his redeemer and his friend, if he will so obey. Yes, much is said today throughout the land concerning the resurrection of Christ. Much should be said. Let's make sure that once again we search what the scriptures have to say. Make sure that what's taught about Christ is according to his truth and not man's tradition. The resurrection of Christ makes demands. The demand that we obey him. Will you do that this morning? If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and let me ask you a question, what better time will you ever have than right now to unite in faith the message of the gospel because of your faith, because of your trust to repent of your sins, confess Christ as Lord, be baptized into Christ that sins might be washed away, You'll be added to that kingdom, as we've said, that we can willingly work in, lovingly labor in every day of our lives. If you need to respond to Jesus, the risen Christ, in an obedient faith, won't you come right now while together we stand and sing?